Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com for premium picks. Look us up in the sports section on Roku. We're there. Dwyer Boxing and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. It looks like two big names are moving from 140 into the welterweight division at 147. They are champion Danny Garcia and former champion Amir Khan. Right, Both guys are in their mid-twenties. I believe Danny and Khan are 26 and 27 years old. So they're in the prime of their careers. Also, the way boxing works is that younger guys are able to fight at lighter weight classes. But as they grow older and as their body matures, they will then move up in weight classes. Think Oscar De La Hoya. Think Manny Pacquiao. Think Floyd Mayweather. There comes a time when, quite frankly, it's unhealthy to keep yourself at the lower weight. So, great middleweight champion, Bernard Hopkins, lost a couple of matches, then decided to gain weight to fight at light heavy. Understand, Hopkins went from 160 to fighting Antonio Tarver at 175. And Hopkins, in many interviews leading up to that fight, talked about how he felt stronger than he had in several years. Right, This was a guy who was always in shape, but couldn't let his body go. The extra 15 pounds actually allowed him to take in more carbs, to put on more muscle, to actually let his body exhale a little bit. Well, let me tell you, the weight gain has actually enabled Hopkins to continue on in the sport at a very high level for several years. Right? Hopkins has been fighting the Kelly Pavliks of the world, the Chad Dawsons of the world, the Tavares Clouds of the world, right? He literally has gone from great middleweight champion to great light heavyweight champion, and that's late in his career. So understand, if a fighter can keep his game together, right, if he can keep the advantages that he has at the lower weight. Sometimes gaining weight is a good thing, right? Sometimes gaining weight means that the fighter doesn't have to deplete himself before fights to make weight. Now, as longtime viewers know, sometimes though, gaining weight puts you in the wrong neighborhood. Right? You used to be the big man on campus. Literally, physically, the big man on campus. In your former weight class. Now suddenly, it's like going to high school. It's no longer 8th grade. Suddenly, you're looking around, and the guys around you are bigger. Some of these guys might even carry a bigger punch than you've ever seen. I suspect that Saul Alvarez in moving up from 154 to 160 is going to have problems. We just saw the problems Adrian Broner had moving into the welterweight division. He did win the title, but then, of course, his fight style of standing there playing chess with you, not moving around the ring, right, cost him against Marcus Maidana. The point is simply, whether a fighter is successful in the higher weight class really depends on who the fighter is, the fight style they're bringing to the table, what the fighter does. Now, Bernard Hopkins has always 
since at least he's been in the public eye, not maybe his first two fights, but since he's been in the public eye, he's always had great defense. Right? It's very hard to remember a Hopkins fight where Hopkins is getting hit flush repeatedly. There have been moments. He was down against Segundo Mercado. By the way, that video is up on YouTube. Of course, he was down against Jean Pascal. But that's rare. Most of these Hopkins fights, even when he's fighting big punchers like Tavares Cloud, have him escaping damage, really inflicting more damage than he's taking in. Right? His hands are always up. He's able to defend himself. I believe a guy like that can jump weight classes. I believe Hopkins, if he wanted, yes, at 49 years of age, could move up to cruiser and give guys problems. Because I don't believe a lot of those guys would be able to hit him. Right? Defensive-minded guys think differently than the rest of us. Right? I'm sure Hopkins would view Marco Huck as a right hand, not much of a left hand, more of an athlete than a fighter. And I'm sure Hopkins would come up with a strategy where he wouldn't get hit by much in that fight. If you're not getting hit, you're not getting hurt. Now let's talk about Danny Garcia at 147 pounds. Now folks know that I don't believe Danny Garcia, who is a courageous fighter, right? He's certainly a warrior, but I don't believe he's that complicated. I view Danny Garcia as a mid-range hooker. I'll agree, he's a clever mid-range hooker. He can shorten up some punches, sure, right? YouTube viewers have pointed out to me that at times Danny Garcia can somewhat straighten out his right hand. I'll agree with that. Okay, I'll, I'll concede that. But this is a guy who Ashley Teopain may have beaten. The fight went the distance. Right, this was a guy against whom a faded Kendall Holt made it to the later rounds. Right, just from a degree of difficulty in dealing with Danny Garcia, I believe clever defensive fighters know how to do it. You just saw one, Mauricio Herrera. Many people here online have privately tweeted me saying, hey, or left comments saying, Dwyer, when are you going to come up with a post-fight video on that Herrera fight? I'm telling you that part of YouTube Nation is outraged by the scoring in that fight, and they believe Herrera won the fight. I can tell you that Danny's own father has issued a statement, and I agree with the statement, by the way, because I'm old school, that you have to beat the champ to take his title. I haven't yet watched that fight in full, right? Depending on the timing, maybe I'll come up with a video, maybe I won't. But just understand, Mauricio Herrera is the tip of the iceberg. Danny is physically more imposing and more explosive at 140 than he is at 147. But I'm here to tell you there's a reason why Eric Morales chose Danny Garcia as an opponent. By the way, Morales, I know he got destroyed in the rematch. Understand, Morales went the distance with Danny Garcia in the first fight. Right? Mid-range hookers can be defensed at the elite level. I believe Danny Garcia is going to have problems at 147 pounds. Maybe he'll be physically stronger than at 140. The problem, though, is the level of the competition at 147. Right? I believe Danny Garcia, Brandon Rios, another guy, these guys are going to find out that other guys can block their shots, that their punches are too wide and too predictable. Right? Knockouts cause amnesia. I'm here to tell you, I thought Amir Khan looked awfully good in the first two rounds against Danny Garcia. He did get caught. 
I'm not saying Amir Khan won that fight. Far from it. He got stopped. Right? But what I want you to do is to look at how a fighter with straighter punches and superior hand speed dealt with Danny Garcia in the early parts of that fight. Look at the CompuBox numbers. On Mauricio Herrera's success with his jab in his fight against Danny Garcia. Now understand how deep the water is at 147. And folks, this is one of the deepest divisions out there. Right? You have some very skilled fighters. Very good defensive fighters. Timothy Bradley. Devin Alexander. Sean Porter. Adrian Broner. Right? You have guys with above average defenses in the division. You also have guys with hand speed. Right? Manny Pacquiao. Kel Brook. Right? Devin Alexander. Alexander has defense and hand speed. They're all lurking in the water here at 147, right? And so in my opinion, Danny Garcia is headed for the cliff, right? He has the name, the public, which doesn't really break things down by weight class, knows he's an unbeaten champion. They know that. They don't know about the Ashley Theo Payne fight. They don't. By the way, Ashley Teopain is a guy who hangs around, you guessed it, the dominant gym at 147. The Mayweather gym. Right? So Danny Garcia, as I can tell, has a big fight me please sign tattooed on his chest. Big name wrong division right maybe he can't make 140 but I'm telling you in my opinion if he were to fight Floyd Mayweather Manny Pacquiao Timothy Bradley Cal Brook I think he gets destroyed at 147 pounds Right? I just feel those guys defensively. Let me throw in Adrian Broner. Those guys defensively are just too advanced for a mid range hooker. Right? Whether you have the belt or not, it's about what you're doing in the ring. I just believe those guys are too advanced for a mid range hooker. Right? I just feel, too, that Danny's going to find out that his punches don't hurt as much at 147 as they do 140. Right? I view Danny Garcia as potentially a big payday for a Floyd Mayweather. Would look good on the resume. You would see an opponent that got beaten with an undefeated record. Right, so if I were Danny Garcia, and I know this is going to sound cynical, but hey, I believe life is cynical at times. If I were Danny Garcia, I would stay out of the ring for a while. Right, I would, you know, quietly get my body and mind ready to make the move to 147. Then I would try to bite off the biggest name I could take. Why? Because that's the biggest payday. If you're going to be exposed, and I think he would be, if you're going to be exposed fighting, let's say a Devin Alexander, right? Then why would you fight Alexander? He doesn't have a belt right now, right? I would literally hang around. Danny Garcia is with Golden Boy, big time promoter. I would stay outside of the ring, then I would come back against a Floyd Mayweather. Right? 
the winner of the Bradley Manny Pacquiao fight. Since the winner of the Bradley Pacquiao fight is going to be top rank, right? Um, they're promoters, and since Danny is a Golden Boy guy, it's much more likely he would fight Floyd than a top rank fighter. Okay, you understand the politics of boxing. But if I were Danny, certainly I would try to fight Floyd. I would try to get the biggest payday possible. I would try to bank millions of dollars. For Danny, quite frankly, the risk reward is actually better than it would be fighting a lesser fighter. Because think about it. If you fight Floyd Mayweather, number one, it's a title fight. Right? No one's going to begrudge you for fighting for the title. Your critics can't really say you're dodging them when you're fighting the best in boxing. Right? Number two, if you get destroyed by Floyd, you're destroyed by an all-time great. Right? People will still think you have game. Just that your game didn't measure up to his game. Right? If you get destroyed by Keith Thurman. Number one, you don't get the title. Right? Number two, people are going to quest question your viability at 147. So if those questions are going to come up, you might as well aim for the tallest target, the biggest target. And of course, as I like to say, even when you're fighting a great champ, if you have a punch, at least you have a puncher's chance. Right? I think Danny, quite frankly, is in for a hard time at 147 pounds. Let's talk about Amir Khan. With Khan, it's a little bit more complicated. Right? The question with Khan is, how does he wear the weight? Now, I know Khan lost to Danny Garcia, as I said earlier. Right? But boxing sometimes doesn't makes sense, right? It's really rock, paper, scissors. Khan lost that fight. Let me say this. It doesn't mean Khan would lose every time he fights Danny Garcia. Also, Khan is a harder matchup than Danny Garcia. Khan's not a mid-range hooker. Khan actually used to be, with Freddie Roach, more of an ambush fighter. In fact, really a prototypical ambush fighter. Now he's with Virgil Hunter, his style's changing a bit. He's, he's adding more of an inside game to what he does. But understand, Khan has exemplary hand speed. Few can match his hand speed. You have to get into the Manny Pacquiao area code to be in the area code of Amir Khan's hand speed. Right? Khan, quite frankly, can play a distance game. He's not mid-range. At times, he's long range, right? He can take on even technically proficient fighters like Pauli Malignaggi, a former champ at 147, and actually pepper him with jabs from distance, soften him up before stopping him, right? Let me point out too, understand, Malinaji, I believe, has only been stopped two times in his entire career. And this is a guy who has fought people like Prime Miguel Cotto. Right? The first stoppage is suspect. It's to Ricky Hatton. Right? And when you look at the stoppage, his corner really stopped him. More than Ricky Hatton. His corner threw in the towel. But the Amir Khan stoppage is actually, in my opinion, legit. Paulie was getting battered in that fight, right? Understand Amir Khan using length and a jab and hand speed and timing can literally dismantle a technically proficient guy like Paulie Malignaggi. I think any guy who can't move because Khan also has foot speed would have a very hard time with Khan. Khan could fight a pedestrian fight with movement behind a jab and, in my opinion, beat Adrian Broner. 
right? The guys who would give Khan a hard time, and this is assuming that Khan brings his speed, not just his hand speed, but his foot speed, up a weight class, right? That's an open question. You don't know if that's happened until you've seen the guy in the ring. We've all seen guys at higher weight classes look sluggish, right? But I believe the guys who would give Khan the biggest problems at 147, and understand, I feel Khan is a competitive fight at 147 against Floyd Mayweather, right? I'm going to leave Manny Pacquiao out of the discussion because Khan and Pacquiao used to train and spar together. So there isn't an element of surprise regarding those two. But the two guys I don't believe Khan has really sparred with or played around with in the ring, where on fight night there'd be some mystery, would be Timothy Bradley and Kel Brook. Right? I believe both of those guys beat Amir Khan. I think that Bradley has an inside game. Forget the Bradley outside game you saw against Juan Manuel Marquez. Think about the inside game he showed against Devin Alexander. Right? To me, the way to beat an ambush fighter is to follow him after the ambush. Bradley has the inside game to do just that. I think you'd see a different Bradley than the Bradley you saw against Richland Provotnikov. Right? and Juan Manuel Marquez. I think Bradley has the foot speed and inside game to get inside on Amir Khan to give him problems. Right? Also, and this will be controversial, but I believe Kel Brook is a hoverer. Right? He's not an ambush fighter. He's more of a Daniel Gill type guy. He's always around. You know the house guests in your home where they're visiting you and you're in the kitchen and they're there? Then you go to the living room to watch TV and they're there? Then you try to go to the bathroom and somehow they're in the bathroom before you get to the bathroom? You know the house guests who just won't leave you alone? That's Cal Brook. I think Cal Brook, by hovering and peppering Amir Khan with hand speed, would wear him out. Right? So, let me say to both of those guys, welcome to 147. I view the future as a bit brighter for Amir Khan than I do a guy who beat him, Danny Garcia. Let me also say, too, that with the influx of new talent, what this means is that Floyd and Manny really don't have to ever face each other to get big paydays, right? Because the water is so deep at 147 pounds that there are a host of guys out there who would be big money opponents, Right, Amir Khan, and I know this is subject to debate. I understand there was a problem on some promotions, but Amir Khan's box office. He's one of the few guys who can generate a crowd on both sides of the Atlantic. Right, I believe Danny Garcia would be box office. That's an easy sell. A reigning champ, an unbeaten champ, spectacular highlights. A resume that includes victories over big names. I believe Boxing Hall of Famers, future Boxing Hall of Famers, Eric Morales and Zab Judah, right? Um, the point is, the water's deep at 147 pounds. If two fighters didn't want to fight each other, they wouldn't have to. Understand, too, with Floyd Mayweather, Mayweather also... I believe still has a share of the belt at 154 pounds, right? So Mayweather doesn't even have to be committed to 147. Didn't he just annihilate Canelo not too long ago, right? So 
Manny and Floyd never have to face each other. I believe you're going to see some guys go out right into the sunset with spectacular fights. I believe Brandon Rios gets hit too much to survive at 147 pounds. Right? Understand, Keith Thurman's nickname is one time. There's a reason. Right? Some guys at 147 have punches and can finish you. Let me point out, too, that if you're defensively challenged and you're fighting a guy like Robert the Ghost Guerrero, don't forget him. Right? All we know is he lost to Floyd. Right? That doesn't mean he's not championship level. He's just not Floyd level. But understand, if a guy like Brandon Rios were to fight the Ghost, I think the ghost would make quick work of him. Put it this way. I believe that mismatch would be obvious by the sixth round. Rios has a chin. He can get hit with even Mike Alvarado shots for several rounds. right? But the bottom line is, in terms of boxing skill, at 147, you have numerous guys. Devin Alexander. I think Alexander would make Rios look awfully bad. right? You have a bunch of guys with big time boxing skills in a division that's too crowded for a defensively challenged guy to have any sustained length of success. Let me hear from you. Tell me if I'm being unfair to unbeaten Danny Garcia or to Amir Khan. I know in the UK there's a big discussion on Kell Brook versus Amir Khan. I think Kell Brook takes that fight. Right? Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. Thanks for stopping by.